even our own fans, right? I'm not, I, I don't want to get beaten up in the arena, right? But even our own fans, like sometimes I'll sort of be frowning at people shouting during the anthem. Like I'm not, I'm not one of those, put my hand on my heart. It's not my anthem, right? But I, sure. I, I sing it. I'm respectful. People shouting things out when the national anthems are going on. And I don't know. To me, Like during just... O Canada? No. Who not... feels bad about O Canada? <laughs> you know, but that would, do, that would be one thing where I'd look at them and be like, that's super disrespectful. But when you're sure. doing it during the Star Spangled Banner, that's like, how it's, bizarre. That's like, are the Canadians the one jeering no. the Star Spangled Banner? That's, they're not, uh, that's it's, just... it's American fans of, of our team, but they're, they're not jeering it. They're just shouting things like, you know, let's go Panthers. And it's like, can, oh, can you not about that? Wait two minutes? <laughs> you weirdo. <laughs> two minutes. For two minutes of the three hours we're here tonight, someone asked you to not shout random shit out. But you can't wait? Sure, I suppose. I'm not mad at it being people being excited about their team during the National Anthem. It's a hype song. It gets you going. I've never heard it described as a hype song. <laughs> I love that. I'm not saying <laughs> Americans. I'm not saying it's a, it's not a it's not not a hype song. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm just saying I've never heard it called hype. I've never heard the word hype. It gets it gets I don't know it it, it crescendos. Well, it does the whole thing. It's good. That's the other one. I didn't understand before the series. You know when people chant USA USA. And by the way, Americans, sure. I I I will say this. Do it way too much. Unapologetically, your chants suck. You have the worst chants of any country I've ever been to if you're chanting USA 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 there's a problem so I would like to start a company where you invite me I teach you some good chants and then I get paid royalties every time you use my chants but I didn't the, the, the English really do have a lock on the like somehow some dude will stand up and improvise a song to a known tune and he'll pick the most devastating 14 words to insult the other team and then the entire crowd will figure it out and sing that entire f-ing chant at them it's devastating like england knows what to do yeah. to insult their enemies through song improvised improvised song it's yeah. crazy and and for ex- a good example for fans who don't know the game but there's a there's a player called luis suarez and he, he does have a big set of <laughs> bitey yeah a big set of upper teeth <laughs> and so fans of other clubs will sing your teeth are offside your teeth are offside. <laughs> Luis Suarez, your teeth are offside, right? So, sure. so it gets very personal and whatever we read in the paper becomes a chant. And and it's funny. And I it's mean, clever. hold on, hold on. Suarez literally bit a dude though. Oh, so he, he put the teeth to use. Yeah. So like yeah. three times. <laughs> Three times right. he's been caught biting. Yeah. So so we have good chance. And I didn't understand before the series because it felt weird listening to people chant USA, USA. And sure. it wasn't 20,000 people doing it. It was, you know, a couple of hundred. But now I've just seen like the reaction from, and, and to be clear, Canucks, I'm, I'm applauding the Canucks fans because we've never had so much support online from other Canadian franchises who hate Edmonton. Hate the Oilers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's a <laughs> lot of Canadians who are sort of like, you know, like, oh, it'd be way better if it was in Canada right now because we sure. created hockey and it's... It's our cup and da 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 da. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's an interesting fan base. All right. The worst though, the Bruins fans. God damn, they're the worst. Bruins. I mean, it's Rangers. Boston. There's there's nothing redeeming about a Boston <laughs> fan. Sorry to everyone I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they are the worst. Bruins fans, I, I love you because I lived there, but you are the worst. I mean, you're, you're, you're chirping and you're not even in the final. Oh, the worst. <laughs> All right. We'll see how much of that survives the cut. <laughs> Welcome to Acceptance Criteria, where we talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly of how software gets made and how we can all do a better job together. My name is Kevin Thomas Euland, and across the chat from me is Andrew Greener. Say hi, Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Hmm. We're also here to get deeper on the human elements. I could go on for an eternity about people and how they think about the process of building complex systems. And I can't think of two better people to do that than Kevin and I. Yeah, you know what? We are the two best people to talk about this week's topic. (laughs) It's not at all true. Uh, However, if you've got a topic that you'd like to come discuss or rant about, drop us a note and we'll see if we can get you on as a guest on a future episode. You can go to acceptancepod.com forward slash guest and submit your ideas. And a quick reminder, whether this is your first episode or you've been listening for a while, we wouldn't say no to your going and dropping five stars on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and leaving us a nice review. And if you want to leave us a bad review, remember, 
remember the name of the podcast is Critical Role. Also tell your friends if you like the show and that they should check it out. Some of the best podcasts out there go by word of mouth and we'd much appreciate it. And finally, a friendly reminder that we are always interested in hearing questions directly from you, our listeners, for our segment, User Stories. If you've got a scenario you'd like help with, whether it's working with an engineering or product team member, trying to figure out how to solve an agile process problem, but you just can't understand why your favorite app updated everything and it's now terrible, we're here to talk it through with you. You can send those questions to acceptancepod at gmail.com or submit them on the Discord in the User Stories channel. And we might be able to help on a future episode. And we're happy to keep it anonymous so no one can trace it back to you if you end up talking to a coworker or something. On this week's show, we'll do our best to explain the concepts behind blockchain technology and whether there's anything valuable left after the NFT and Bitcoin hype has basically died already. Yeah, it's, I'm going to be like a baby this week. Like blockchain technology, I get. The rest is a blur to me. Very confusing. So it's going to be interesting to talk about. For some of our listeners who don't know, we're going to have some definition and explanation and try to simplify it because it is a like an unregulated conversation almost. Like this, this whole Web 3.0 and blockchain and crypto, it, there's, there's not a lot of boundaries around it. So we'll be, we'll be in all the different places that you might have heard of it. And it is super confusing which is probably one of the reasons why I have a challenge with it. It's, it doesn't feel well contained. So yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, that. I think we'll get into that, especially the Web3 stuff. But before we get to all of that, let's take a short break and we'll be right back. All right, welcome back. This is a segment we like to call competitive analysis, where we'll look at a product or app or technology and talk through our impressions, how we think some of the product and engineering decisions were made to arrive at how the thing works, and share our thoughts on how good or bad we think it is. So today's topic is blockchain technology, with everything from crypto and Bitcoin to NFTs and those stupid ape JPEGs. So as Greener said, I think we should start with the definition and just sort of explain to folks what it is before we get into the possibly positive but mostly negative <laughs> use cases. I think this every use of this technology turns into a massive Ponzi scheme designed to maximize profit for the early investors by swindling the late coming rubes. So uh, I think we can handle the definitions, but yeah, it's it's mostly bad as far as I can tell. So blockchain is a technology developed in sort of fits and starts starting all the way back in 1982 with a dissertation from cryptographer David Chaum. I'm assuming I'm pronouncing C-H-A-U-M, Chaum, Chaum, and iterated on by several people through the 90s. In 2008, Satoshi Nakamoto, which is a pseudonym for one person Person or possibly a group of people. And we'll stop right there and say, that's not shady at all. No one actually knows who this person is. So anyway, Satoshi Nakamoto introduced the concept of decentralization on top of the previous researcher's work and seems to have coined the phrase blockchain as part of his introduction of Bitcoin in 2008. So what is the blockchain itself? Amazon describes it on the AWS developer portal like this, quote, blockchain technology is an advanced database mechanism that allows transparent information sharing within a business network. A blockchain database stores data in blocks that are linked together in a chain. Fucking amazing, Jeff Bezos. Thank you. Great. No comments. It's a series of blocks in a chain. Well, now I understand. All right. So I don't love any of the documentation I've read on this thing. So I had to figure out how to describe this. So I'm going to take a stab at it. The block is some data, usually a record describing a transaction that has occurred between two or more parties. It's the piece of information you want to store securely. So that's the block. The chain is a piece of technology called a cryptographic hash. And that's why stuff like Bitcoin is also called crypto cryptocurrency or just crypto. Don't worry, we'll explain what that is in a moment, but basically you take all of the data in a block and run it through a cryptographic process that spits out a long string of random numbers and letters. If you pass in the word dog, you will always get the same random mash of numbers and letters, but from that mash, it's basically impossible to figure out that the word was originally dog. So that cryptographic hash links the new block that you're saving to the previous block that was last saved and chains them together. This chain is the security mechanism that says, hi, I'm new block of data 901, and I'm aware that right behind behind me is block 900, and the cryptographic hash of the block right behind me, 900, is whatever, x42gb, blah, 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 blah. So how it's a chain is because if someone went back and tried to change block 900, and claim that they were actually supposed to be paid, you know, a million dollars instead of a hundred dollars, that would change the hash that block 900 generates. So because it's taking, like I said, puts dog in, spits out a, a series of things, you put in all of the information about block 900, and it spits out a very unique string of numbers and letters, and you can't figure out why. So now block 901 stores the hash of block 900 behind it. And so now if I try to change block 900, the hash changes, so now I need to change block 901, except the hash of block 900 is included 
included in the definition of block 901 that then gets hashed into the hash that gets stored on block 902. So now block 902's hash will have to change, which means block 903's hash will have to change. And so now the malicious attacker who was just trying to update block 900 has to update every single block that came after it. It's a chain of data. And so this chain is the way that you basically supposedly make this incredibly secure. We'll talk about that in more detail. There's a bunch of other stuff that we'll cover, but basically a hacker can't pull that off. There's a bunch of technical reasons why that we'll get into, but you would have to hack thousands, possibly millions, possibly billions of additional blocks, all because you wanted to change the original block 900. So in theory, it's impossible. In theory, the chain makes it so that you can just have secure data. It's a complex topic, so I'm going to keep breaking it down here. I think we want to talk through what are the goals of the technology? Why did they come up with this in the first place? What are the components of the technology? And then we'll talk through some real world examples of how it works today. So we can start with the goals. There's several key goals for the technology that are supposedly attractive in certain scenarios. The first one is decentralization. The blockchain is managed by a peer-to-peer -peer network. You know, the thing you used to use to connect to your friend's computers in college in the early 2000s to chat and steal music. There is no central authority, which means there's less need for direct trust between various parties involved in transactions. The AWS page uses an example of buying a house. The seller and the buyer can't trust each other. The buyer could claim that they sent the money when they didn't, and the seller could claim that they never received the money when they did. Usually you need a third party like a bank to mediate between you. In a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network, all parties have to agree that the transaction occurred or neither side commits to the transaction. And often there are other peers on the network who are disinterested parties, kind of like the bank, and they can provide additional validation. So this decentralization is supposedly good because it means you can not need to trust each other. You all just trust each other as a community. Uh, we'll get into that anyway. So next up is immutability. Immutability. So this means something that can't be edited or changed once it's been written. As we described earlier, those blocks basically can't be edited because of the chain of cryptographic hashes. The blockchain basically says, ah, shoot, you meant $10, not 100. Better log a second fixed transaction to amend the previous one because we aren't updating that for you. That's the whole point of the chain. But let's go back to the hacker who wants to change an old transaction to a million dollars. Even if they did spend the computational effort to rehash 100,000 blocks, the decentralized nature means everyone else on the network is suddenly going to be asked to approve all of those changes and they're all going to reject those changes. So you really won't be modifying old blocks on the chain, basically, and that's good, I guess. Fraud is pretty hard, I suppose. So yay, immutability. <laughs> I mean, it does seem like it's a weird, th we'll get into this, but like the immutability part of it is both the complexity of the crypto hash, but yes. also just trust. It's kind of like we're hoping no one, like you just assume that everyone else on the network agrees we're not going to chain it, which we'll get into. Anyway, it's it's a weird thing where the immutability is not actually built into the technology. You can absolutely go and try to change block 900. It just is incredibly, incredibly hard. And, and I don't know. It's it's a weird one. There's not actually like read-write permissions built into any of this. It's just all of everyone agreeing not to do it and making it nearly impossible. But I don't know. It feels slightly weird. It, anyway. It's what got Al Capone, man. <laughs> having the right, ledger, exactly. having the ledger and not being able to fudge it. That's what took Capone down. So Exactly. There you go. The next goal of the blockchain is called consensus. And so at least 51% of the peers on the network must agree that the new block to be added to the chain is valid. And how that happens varies, though there's two primary methods. One is called proof of work. This is the mining that you've probably heard about with Bitcoin. There's a computationally expensive calculation that you have to do to, quote, earn the right to post to the blockchain. We'll discuss this and its disastrous side effects on climate change later. The other option for not doing mining is called proof of stake. And this is a slightly more eco-friendly option where the stake is basically like the ante in poker. You need to have some financial skin in the game to be a trusted member of the network and have the opportunity to the right to the blockchain. Either way, regardless of the proof method, you need the people trying to write to the blockchain to have a hard time doing it and the rest of the network who approve the changes to have an easy time of making approvals. And you must get a majority of the people to approve the change. It's another reason why hacking the blockchain is almost impossible. Not only do you have to convince 51% of the people that your change to block 900, now being a million dollar transaction is valid, you've got to convince 51% of them to accept the changes to the rest of the chain, possibly thousands, millions, or billions of blocks that would need to be updated because of that cryptographic chain. And your proof of work or proof of stake is too expensive. So either you've heard about, you know, people mining Bitcoin and having entire rooms full of CPU or GPUs and fans going just to mine one Bitcoin. Imagine if you had to change a million blocks and you had to do that because it was proof of work. Even proof of stake has a financial thing. So you now have to put up, I don't know, $100,000 
characters in Ante, basically. There's supposedly this consensus and the proof concept is supposed to also guard against people messing with the data, basically. So uh, let's talk about the pieces of technology that go into the blockchain. What are the components? So the first component are blocks. We've talked about the blocks in concept, and the goal of this episode isn't to discuss the actual engineering implementation, but the blocks are the granular pieces of data that should be stored securely on the blockchain and which have that cryptographic hash providing the chain of evidence to the previous block. The blocks are kind of anything that you want them to be. So it's not like, a, I mean, it's kind of like a database row, I guess. It's not just the column value in a row. It is the entire row, basically, and it can be whatever you want. So if you want to store 30 different data points about the transaction, if this was like purchasing a house, there's probably hundreds of points of information. The block definition kind of apparently doesn't really matter. It is just the chunk of data that you want to be secure and to count as the record. Yeah, and if, if you're hearing all this stuff for the first time and you're thinking, oh, well, this sounds like a distributed ledger, that's because it absolutely is. And so that's one of the most, that's one of the most fundamental sort of statements you can make about, about the technology in general. So the distributed ledger is the common database or data file. Again, the specific implementation doesn't matter for this episode, but each member of the peer-to-peer -peer network has its own copy of the database, and that database is basically exactly like a financial ledger. It's a log of all the transactions. Sorry, something popped into my head about distributed ledger. It wasn't immutability, it was redundancy, but... Well, yeah, it is, it's... Yeah, I wanted to make sure people understood that, like, when they're thinking, like, hey, well, I can take machines out of it, it's like, well, actually, yeah, but it's redundant, so you're not... You can't steal one machine out of the out of the distributed ledger without the others sort of having that redundancy, but that's okay, I won't get that. Yeah, there is a weird part of this, which is... So, I don't know, we're kind of jumping ahead, but when you get into some of the technologies, they are in this, like, consortium of... Uh, we've all agreed to store this type of ledger and we're all members who are all deciding not to trust each other and to build this consensus. And so just everybody in that group who's all agreed to talk about Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever it is, all just have that copy. And so, yeah, if one person decides to try and go and be like, well, I'm going to take my Bitcoin ledger over here. It's like, well, cool, but it's this weird social contract in required as well. I don't know. It's, it's a weird series of interlocking dependencies, which is probably kind of smart. Smart contracts. Apparently there are are ways to provide instructions for the proper way to create different types of blocks and people can also write little applications with if then else logic and save them as blocks on the chain. Those smart contracts supposedly have some benefit but the biggest example we saw was the NFTs so you know. I mean it, yeah if, if your only example if the only feature you can point out is that smart tr contracts are great for NFTs we'll get into why that's ridiculous but yeah <laughs> I don't know this is part this is the part of the research where I was like hmm cool <laughs> that seems stupid uh, yeah uh, and we'll get into why there's some weird things that happen with smart contracts so remember earlier when we said you can't change and fix the ten dollar transaction you gotta mo you gotta create a second transaction imagine what that does when you have a bug in your code so we'll get back to that so the fourth component in all of this is public key cryptography this is that cryptographic hash which is just a fancy way of saying they do some super complex encryption that produces a fixed output think of a really advanced version of the cipher you'd see in a kid's book you know where every letter in the alphabet was swapped to mean something else and you had to look for the most common letter and that was probably what was swapped for the letter E and decode the sentence. It's basically just really crazy advanced versions of that that's wildly oversimplifying. But everyone on the peer-to-peer -peer network gets their own private key and then a single public key is shared with everybody. I've never really bothered to learn how public and private keys work, but basically one person uses their private key to encrypt data and everyone else can use the public key to decrypt it. If someone only has the public key, they can't create encrypted messages that can be decoded by it without their own private key. So unless you hack one of the members on the network to get get their key, everyone's safe. Which, okay, I mean, how many, we're going to talk in a future breaking news episode how many companies constantly get hacked. So I guess don't get hacked, basically? Yeah, so that one seems a little risky. I've always thought private key and public key is one of those things where, like, as soon as, I don't know, as soon as you have access to the admin password and you can go and find those keys, then <laughs> I know there's other technologies trying to do key stores and stuff, but still, I this one seems like a fairly weak point in the entire thing, and I would imagine, I don't know, did we talk about hacking and some of the, yeah, I think we talked about a couple of the cases where they got hacked and lost billions of dollars. Anyway. All right. So let's talk about how this is getting used in the real world today. We'll discuss the what... Uh, of what these things are. So we're going to talk about Bitcoin and NFTs and some others. We're going to leave the problems aside. So we're just going to describe what Bitcoin does and is. And the value judgments, and there will be value judgments, will come later. So the first one is Bitcoin. Up until now, you might have thought Bitcoin and blockchain were the same thing. And that's fair. They were both created by that same, not at all shady pseudonym, Satoshi Nakamoto, back in 
complete. If blockchain is the rectangle, then Bitcoin is one of the squares, a type of implementation of blockchain technology. Bitcoin is a decentralized cryptocurrency using all of the blockchain tech we just discussed with proof of work as the consensus building method. That means to get 51% of the network to agree that you can add a Bitcoin to the ledger, you have to do a computationally intensive process of calculating what's called a nonce, which it doesn't matter, it's a number that is hard to produce and requires specialized hardware and crazy power consumption to calculate. It's basically recreating the need, difficulty, and rarity of mining for gold or silver, which is how we used to base our currency on, is the rarity of those materials. And by increasing the computational difficulty, they make the production of new Bitcoins rare, which makes them have perceived value. It gets a little weird. Gold was rare, therefore that's how we based our, <laughs> our currency system. So now it's hard to make Bitcoins and those are rare and therefore they have value. It's, I don't know, it feels, it's a Ponzi scheme. We'll get to it later. <laughs> it's this weird process where multiple peers on the network all try to calculate the same nonce, but only one of them wins apparently. And so not only do you have to invest the hardware and compute time, but there's a chance you do all of that compu compute work and don't even get the Bitcoin at the end, which I'm sure adds to the insane carbon footprint since you have, say, a dozen people all mining for the Bitcoin, but only one of them gets the financial benefits. So 11 out of 12 just wasted all of that processing power for nothing. It's not totally clear to me. I'm glad you you brought this up because one of the biggest questions I've had is when they're doing when you're doing this heavy computation, can it be that, that there's 20 there's 20 of the nodes doing the computation, but only one wins? So the 19 of us are like, well, I was at 99 percent. As far as I can tell, I yes. was almost and... like, like, how is that not? the first thing you would try to fix in this whole, well, it sounds terrible. But that's the point is they're not trying to, right? They want the rarity of the coin. It's, it's supposed to replicate like the horribly racist and terrible gold rush of the 1840s. It's supposed to be if you got to the mine first and you mined all that gold, you're the one who got rich. It's no, no, weird. no, which is fine, but the, it, there's no relevance to the 19 other nodes that didn't finish in time, right? No, they fully just wasted their they, time they trying fully to do just that, wasted as far that. as I can tell. So how yeah. is that not one of the first things you would fix? I mean, I, I'm basically saying, how do we optimize this criminal organization, by the way? Right, <laughs> right yeah, but, exactly. But no. How is that not one of the first things you would fix if one of the biggest challenges with all of this is the power consumption? Like, But, but isn't that just, I think that's fundamental. The whole point of the rarity of the the proof of work generates the you, the rarity and the rarity is the alleged value. This is why this entire thing is bad. It's a bad idea. We'll get to that. So why did somebody invent Bitcoin? <laughs> why don't why did somebody think it wasn't a bad idea? What's it solving for? <laughs> Economist Paul Krugman argues that cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin are only used by bank skeptics and criminals, which, yeah, there's a libertarian central world bank, one world government thing going on <laughs> in the background of a lot of this. But we'll read an excerpt from Wikipedia. Money serves three purposes, a store of value, a medium of exchange, and a unit of account. According to The Economist in 2014, Bitcoin functions best as a medium of exchange. In 2015, The Economist noted that Bitcoins had three qualities useful in a currency. They are hard to earn, limited in supply, and easy to verify. However, by a 2018 assessment by The Economist, it stated that cryptocurrencies met none of these criteria. So I don't... <laughs> the Economist needs to get itself together. Like, that's not like, back in 1980, we thought it was a good idea. And then 40 years later, we've learned, no, they changed their mind in like three years. So maybe stop listening to The Economist is the part of the conclusion here. Friedrich von Hayek's book, The Denationalization of Money, in which he advocates a complete free market in the production, distribution, and management of money to end the monopoly of central banks. So there's, yeah, it's very libertarian. It's very much, I shouldn't have to have Bank of America tell me what I can do with my money. It's Ron Swanson on Parks and Rec burying gold under random trees because he doesn't trust the institutions. But I mean, we haven't been, this, we haven't been, a, I, I mean, the entire global economy is fake. Like we haven't been based on any kind of gold or anything to solve a couple of our financial crises. The U.S. Central Bank has just issued more money, invented new value out of nowhere. So like the entire global economy is ridiculous and stupid. And <laughs> that's probably a problem for us at some point. But the answer doesn't seem like it should be this weird crypto fascist. I don't know what they're doing. So I'm going to do my own little thing. And I don't know. It gets weird really quickly. Well, that's that that is interesting, though, too, right? Because it, it and it's been interesting being in America for the last 10, 15, 20 years and thinking like, oh, no, 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 we're protected by these frameworks, these beautiful 
beautiful <laughs> frameworks that had a lot of thought and great people throughout time put them together and they just, you know, people keep kept amending them. And, but we're safe within that framework. We'll never be rich. Somebody else will, but, but we're <laughs> right. protected. And over the last 10 years with cryptocurrency, it's almost like they just sort of squatted. They moved in. They moved like the anybody who was sort of screaming about regulations, they just sort of, yeah, thank you very much. We're just going to carry on and 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 people and they did people just bought into it right i mean it is it's basically tech bro beanie babies <laughs> Yeah, The U.S. government was never going to try to regulate the Beanie Baby market, and people lost tons of money in that in, the, like, what was that, the late 90s? Yeah, but it's... It, yeah, it is. It's this weird speculative thing where a bunch of people decided it had value, and the U.S. government was like, I guess we're not going to do anything about it, but yeah. And speaking of, the current system screwing people, we're never going to be billionaires, neither are Bitcoin people. Bitcoin wealth is highly concentrated, with 0.01% holding 27% of the in-circulation currency as of 2021. So it's the exact same system it hasn't actually solved it's not democratized money it's the same thing our listeners are going to notice i'm rather quiet this episode and that will show you my interest level in cryptocurrency but <laughs> exactly. kevin brought up something really interesting just then tell me more about the beanie babies do you not remember the beanie babies I I didn't grow up in this country at that time period, so I don't really know. I mean, I know what a Beanie Baby is, but did they... The be irony of you not knowing about the Princess Diana Beanie Baby is amazing. <laughs> okay, this this story gets even better for our listeners. So tell, <laughs> tell us about the Princess Diana Beanie Baby. So for some reason, I don't know if the Beanie Baby company did this on purpose. It's kind of like the Stanley Cup craze, where just like a bunch of white women decided to start collecting them for some reason. So at some point in the 90s, people thought, Beanie Babies were not manufactured sufficiently. It's, I mean, it's some of the definition here in Bitcoin. It's rare <laughs> and it's hard to get a hold of. And so people started valuing Beanie Babies for some reason in like crazy numbers. And so there was a giant rush on getting Beanie Babies and thinking that they were going to have value. And of course, because they don't actually, <laughs> then like all of those types of bubbles, it burst. One of the more rare ones, and again, I don't know if it was actually rare. I was a child. I don't know what was actually going on, but there was a Princess Diana Memorial Beanie Baby that was like emerald blue no is emerald blue sapphire blue it was like blue and it had i don't remember it was like somehow in memoriam of princess diana i assume she it was she, she had to have been dead at this point she died in 97 anyway who knows it was a whole weird thing that i remember it's like the weird version of baseball cards yeah i'm assuming her beanie baby was pre-accident see i'm wondering that her beanie baby was post-accident as like a weird gross commemorative thing well so like everything was like all broke <laughs> Dude, <laughs> cut that out. Are you kidding me? <laughs> That's like, okay. No, it's weird. I, yeah, I have no idea. So I, it's my go-to example of like, these are these weird bubbles that form. It's I, Comics were kind of the same way, right? Like they killed Superman and everyone was like, oh, that'll be a collector issue because the first Superman's worth a million dollars. And so we'll do these events. They tried to kill Daredevil and Batman and did all of these things. And there was this weird 90s boom of people thinking comics were going to be worth a thing. And I don't know, maybe they, some of them still are. It is weird that when the aliens finally come down and they start going, and do the the audit right and they're like C can you explain this thing this little spike in and and we're nope. not able we're not able <laughs> no. to offer sufficient coverage for why they shouldn't destroy the planet and all humans on it right see but this is the thing is okay so our entire system is that way it is no longer based on anything unique we're not based on gold or silver or any kind of rarity of some fort knox is full of i don't think actually fort knox has, has all of the gold anymore but let's pretend fort knox still had all of the gold i guess it's worth something but our economy is not based on that we've all just decided that we're going to do i don't know what else but the current economies of the planet are based on basically beanie babies as far as i can tell all right the last point on on bitcoin is the so i did enjoy this quote from legal scholar eric posner quote a real ponzi scheme takes fraud bitcoin by contrast seems more like a collective delusion <laughs> and yes that, i mean yeah. you could argue our entire economy at this point is a collective delusion but this one's just really ridiculous and, but i think it's the most accurate statement that that resonates with me because if you if a lot of people have probably experienced this through the years with me is if you ask me about bitcoin that is that that statement right there pretty much encapsulates my response which is i'm not as curious about crypto and bitcoin as i am about the collective delusion around it right it does it's one of those fundamental things where if you really try to think about it too hard you realize all currency even when it was based on gold and gold was rare and we all liked gold because it was shiny i guess Yes, <laughs> like go back to the Romans 
and be like, okay, you all decided to stamp coins and you have, I don't know. There's all of human culture has treated money weirdly. And so it does, it technically to me actually feels kind of like what currency is, but we've all just sort of collectively agreed as a global economy that that's not how it's going to work. And so you telling me that I had 42 GPUs spend a hundred hours mining this Bitcoin and that thing is rare and therefore it has value. I'm like, okay, the lint in my dryer trap is rare and you don't have access to it. So do I have suddenly value from it? It's I, what? It's weird. It It's weird. In a, and we often disagree about artwork, right? At least <laughs> AI, but it's weird that somebody can spend hundreds of hours to paint an absolutely gorgeous original piece of art that they can't even sell for $250 because they don't look right. They're not in the market. Nobody's like advertised. Nobody's pushing their work. But yeah, we can take this. Hey, a computer ran hot last night. So that's got to be worth something. A unique piece of art produced by a person is some amount of effort to generate a thing that is truly unique. Yep. And in like a barter based system, I, we're going back to like the freaking pre middle ages, but in a barter based system, that's a thing no one else would have. And so I'd be willing to give you my thing that no one else has that you want. Like there is a version of this that kind of makes sense, but not little bits and bytes that exist on someone's server that promise. Why? Who? I, I just, I don't get it. Maybe I think I also just don't get economics in general and like how the entire global economy works right now which is probably part of this yeah that's that's interesting too because that that's kind of one of my that's one of my blockers with bitcoin crypto this whole conversation is that there's also an element of I, i'm not a stupid guy but i've <laughs> got to be missing something right like maybe right. i probably just don't <laughs> understand the economics of why this is a good idea and then generally with those things you like you learn a little bit more and you're like oh i can fix some of the challenges of this but with this one i yeah i don't i'm definitely not the right man to fix any of the challenges Challenges in Bitcoin. I know that. It definitely feels like one of those just general, every single economist is like, yeah, we know. Don't ask too many questions. It's a fragile thing that the entire thing works this way. We've all kind of just, it's a collective delusion. We've all just kind of agreed that it works this way. So we're going to, am I talking myself into thinking Bitcoin just has value as much as the US dollar does? I, I might be talking myself around because the entire system seems like it's based on just all of us kind of agreeing to a thing. Anyway. All right. So the next topic is... Well, not the next topic. The next part of this conversation is everyone has heard about blockchain and crypto and Bitcoin, probably. And as a result of that, some people might have heard what's called Web3, which was this concept that sort of started to bubble up as blockchain and Bitcoin became popular, which was this idea that the blockchain was going to create the next iteration of the web. And someone at some point, I could probably look up, but I didn't do it because I don't care about... I, this is the problem with this episode is like, I really just want to get to the part of making fun of people because it's such a bad idea. But there are interesting things that happen along the way. I should have done a little bit more research. I didn't. I don't care. Web3 is this concept that the first pre-2000s, pre, you know, the dot-com bubble and earlier was Web 1.0. Just the basic HTML, Internet Explorer, Netscape Navigator, those kinds of things. Web2 was basically social networks starting in mid-2000s all the way to whenever 2000 something teens when Bitcoin and blockchain started to take off. And Web3 is this idea that somehow blockchain is going to revolutionize, democratize, and create the next version of the web. You won't be beholden to Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook because it'll just be this giant peer-to-peer -peer network of data stored on trusted blockchains that we all have to agree to. Everyone's bought into this concept at one point or another in the past decade. Harvard Business Review had a whole thing evaluating it and talking about what goes into Web3. McKinsey got in on it and talked about why it is going to be the next wave of the future. Wikipedia had a, a good call out from the creator of Signal, uh, Moxie Marlin Spike. What an amazing name. Moxie Marlin Spike of uh, created Signal and articulated how Web3 is not as decentralized as it appears to be, mainly due to consolidation in the cryptocurrency field, including in blockchain application programming interfaces, which are currently mainly controlled by the companies Alchemy and Infura, cryptocurrency exchanges, which are mainly dominated by Binance, Coinbase, Metamask, and OpenSea, and the stablecoin market, which is currently dominated by Tether. Marlon Spike also remarked that the new web resembles the old web, which again, if the whole point of the decentralization was you didn't have Microsoft, Google, and Meta controlling everything, now apparently there's two companies who are in control of most of the blockchain APIs and interfaces. So you have it, again, you did all of this work. You started burning the planet faster for what? Yeah, I think I... I think I understand web. Or I I do know I understand web three oh two to to the level of features that I've considered. So a lot of my thinking early when I saw blockchain technology was excitement, but not for crypto, but more for the <laughs> sure. 
Which we'll get to. There's a couple of interesting ideas later, right? Yeah, there's some interesting ideas. And I think initially when I saw it, I, 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 I worried though, because we all know, you know, listeners, anybody who's heard me probably knows that I evolve, right? I just, I just evolve at a million miles an hour. I'm not necessarily thinking about the consequences of people getting left behind. But a lot of my requirements and thinking around Web 3.0 was, cool, I get to separate my internet experience from all the people that I never want to see again. Right. Right. All of the toxic fans of the Florida Panthers. Exactly. Like and, and in, in many ways, like it sounds terrible to say, but it is it my my new internet, my web three O is sort of the first class system online, which is horrible, right? Like terrible. Right? It, it is terrible. And I think there's probably a lot more requirements that these that these web three O sort of visionaries are thinking. So I know we're gonna get into those. But yeah, it just it, it does feel like not that they bit off more than they more than they can chew, but maybe Maybe they, they sort of told you the whole dream, right, ahead of time. And I think probably one of those things we have to evolve into slowly. So, yeah, we had come to sure. Yeah, we'll see. All right, so the thing we evolved into way too quickly and was just awful. I am technically jumping the gun. I'm supposed to do a non-biased explanation of this next topic, which are NFTs. So NFTs, I mean, honestly, I don't even know where to begin because once you realize what an NFT actually is, for anyone listening who hasn't really tried to figure out what was going on there, it's just, it's so dumb. I can't. It's, I, okay. So NFT stands for non-fungible token, which means a $20 bill is fungible because there's nothing special about that specific $20 bill. You could give me a $20 bill. I could shuffle that bill into a stack of other $20 bills, pull one back out to give back to you, and you would not care whether the bill I gave back to you was the same one you added to the stack. You want the $20 value, but you don't care which bill. They are fungible. Technically, I think Bitcoins are also fungible. Once the miner adds a new Bitcoin to the ledger, it doesn't really care whether that specific block on the chain. They don't actually care that they own block 900. It's not their block anymore. They just want the value from it. And so technically, I think Bitcoins are fungible and meaningless compared to all of the other ones, just like a $20 bill is. Being non-fungible, an NFT basically means that the block on the blockchain has to be the specific block that grants you something specific. Think of it like your car's registration or your college diploma. You can't just have any car registration or diploma. You need the one with your name on it. So NFTs were this concept that the blockchain could securely and permanently grant ownership of something. The block says person A paid person B some amount of money and they now own thing C. Except the most common thing you own from NFTs was a digital asset and anyone with a, I don't know, elementary school education at this point, like who doesn't understand digital assets well enough, knows that unless they have something like DRM, digital rights management, protections like they added to MP3s in the early 2000s to crack down on file sharing, unless it has something like a DRM built into it, you can pre- you really can't prevent someone from just copying the, f- the digital asset or the file. You can take a screen grab. You can download it locally to your own machine. There's no protection over digital assets. And yet, if someone was paying $1,000 for an NFT of an image of a weird cartoon ape for some reason, that cartoon ape was just a JPEG file without any DRM on it. You can claim you own the original ape image because the NFT grants you that, right, but the NFT itself doesn't provide any digital protection. It's like just simply having a receipt saying you own the Mona Lisa. Unless the Mona Lisa is physically in your control and no one else has access to it, you don't own the Mona Lisa. So legally, by the way, no one's really sure it actually protected you either. (laughs) It's not really a fully tested copyright and intellectual property claims haven't really been tested with these digital files, apparently. So I can't can't see how this was ever a good idea in theory, much less a lot of people rightly pointed out at the time that it was just a massive scam. We'll get to that in the problem section of this episode, but NFTs are receipts that promise you a thing, and that thing is incredibly easy to steal. So, I don't know. Yeah, this one's a challenge. I try to think about whether it relates to an AI argument, right, which is like how to protect your work online and pre- prevent it from getting sucked into some corporation's commercial where it's like, well, that was my artwork, right? But again, mm-hmm. like to your point, there's actually really nothing <laughs> stopping right. them. Like as you can say, that's my work. Okay, cool. Prove it. Right. We, we, you know, we found the video, right? Let's just got sucked into the AI ether and yep. AI just spat it out, right? Like, show us the gold copy of this that you have. Yeah, it's a weird one. And then I started trying to think to myself, like, is the next generation of this where, well, I want to prove that I was the first person who tweeted this really cool saying once upon a time. So now I get the NFT on the tweet. Which someone did. Someone apparently tried to do NFTs on tweets and it was like, that's okay. Yeah. But nope not how anything works. And by the way, you would hope that before you did all of that, you made sure that the courts, the people who were going to help you enforce whether or not that was true, were on board with this concept. But 
Right. Yeah. So that's the thing when I think about Web 3.0, they, again, not bit of more they can chew, but they just sort of charged in with like all of this dreamy stuff with no right. infrastructure, no regulations, no right. boundaries, no support. It was kind of like, hey, NFTs, and what, what? Some went for tens of millions of dollars, right? Yeah. I don't know that there was that high for NFTs, but there was significant money. I think we've got some quotes down later in the problem section, but yeah, it's, it's not great. It's, I mean, the good news is the Supreme Court just overturned Chevron defense. So regulatory bodies, have no control over this anymore anyways so everyone nfts are going to make a return i'm sure the most expensive nft as far as the 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 item yeah. i'm looking at 91 million dollars i mean so we'll get we're jumping ahead all right so the fun part of the episode where we get to complain about all of this terrible technology so the first one bitcoin it should basically be illegal if not because of the energy usage which is catastrophic in 2021 cambridge university determined that bitcoin at 121 terawatt hours per year used more electricity than argentina and the netherlands argentina is 121 terawatts and netherlands is 109 terawatts according to digiconomist one bitcoin transaction required 708 kilowatt hours of electrical energy, the amount an average U.S. household consumes in 24 days. It is horrifying, bad energy usage policy, and we shouldn't be allowing them to do this. That's just the first part. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> uh-huh. The next part is it's basically turned into an unaccountable money laundering and money fundling scheme. Fundling, funneling scheme. Anyone can become a miner and your accounts on the ledger are pseudonyms. So you can hide your identity. There's no way to actually figure it out. It's basically become a way for white supremacists to funnel money to hate groups and Nazis. So, you know, that part's not great. Wikipedia, on their entry of all of the instances of blockchain exchanges that got hacked <laughs> from 2011 to 2023, had $7 billion in theft, the nature of it is just criminal and bad. Silk Road was the dark web w- website. They used Bitcoin to change illegal goods, got shut down in 2013. It's just, it's a black hole of money that takes it away from any, It's it should be illegal. How is this thing allowed to exist? I don't understand. I, I, do, I don't understand. There's probably going to be one of the most common quotes around crypto. <laughs> If it finally right. dies in 20 years, we're like, why are you killing it? Because like, we, we just don't understand. Like, <laughs> What were you trying to do other than just funnel money? It's, it's literally just a way for rich people to funnel money to each other. And that should be, that is illegal. They found a workaround to it. I just, I, it again, it goes back to that. Who is a, who's asleep at the wheel in American in, 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 <laughs> right. in American politics? That's not sort of saying like, it, it just feels like one of those weird things where you're in a company and there's a development team that just decide to go do something. And, and you're like, is anybody concerned that these guys just sort of turned on like cloud services and now they're building their own platform to do whatever and and <laughs> y- you're pulling your hair out trying to figure out like does anybody care that they're doing that that's how I feel about like crypto nobody cares right well and there are companies doing this analysis chain analysis says between 2009 and 2018 2.5 billion dollars was laundered through bitcoin and the what is it the fraction of cryptocurrency transactions linked to illicit activities had been on the rise since early 2019 in 2020 it's only 0.15% of known cryptocurrency transactions are known to evolve illicit activities. Those are the ones that are known. And still that tiny percentage is still $14 billion of illicit criminal activity being funneled through Bitcoins. And that's what we know about. So no, it's, it's, it's really bad. It is, I don't understand. There's a YouTube link in here, which I'll include in the show notes. If anyone hasn't seen Brennan Lee Mulligan's rant about cryptocurrency, it is delightful. Uh, it, I, uh, Kevin from the future just popping in to say, here is that clip. Brennan, an old-timey prospector who's getting into cryptocurrency. Hey, you listen here. I may have lost part of my brain in a Wolverine attack, but I know one thing and one thing for sure, and that is the blockchain is the future of currency. You think, oh, fiat currency, you want state-backed dollars? What could be better than a completely unaccountable system of absolute strangers and con artists assembled together in a bizarre crypto-fascist commune? We already know that these currencies are being used to fund neo-Nazi and far right organizations, if you're legitimately <laughs> considering using these things, there's something f-ing wrong with you. I'm going to cut uh, you off before no, this, beca- <laughs> this is going to become... How's about that? 
Yeah, and we should, like, it, it's important too, because the, the, these are just little bullets of information, people, but hear those numbers, 7 billion in theft, right? Like, so so this unhackable tech, right, which... It still which, got hacked. It still Lost got hacked. 7 billion dollars. Yeah. Ronin Networks, six, <laughs> approximately 625 million. Poly Networks, 611 million. FTX, 600 million. This is this is potentially your money, people. Coincheck, 534 right. million. And, and also so just scams, right? Well, and that's the thing. Is, so to your point, how how is there all this... If a company called Chain Analysis, whose apparently entire goal is to just analyze blockchain, who at the Department of Justice isn't monitoring that there's clearly money laundering going on? That is your job. And the answer is what? Both parties are bought and paid for by tech corporate interests and have no interest in shutting down all of this money and 0.15% going to bad things doesn't outweigh these massive billions is making even more money and our government isn't going to do anything against it. Like it is this weird, it's this weird thing of like, where's the enforcement? This is clearly money laundering. This is clearly bad. And every once in a while, it feels like Sam Bankman Freed or whatever his name is, gets pulled out as the guy who broke the rules and we sent him to jail and look how we are enforcing these things. And they did it to Bernie Madoff correctly. They do it every once in a while, like once a decade, we get like the sacrificial lamb that's allowed to tell us, oh, we're enforcing. Don't worry. We have this stuff under control. No, you don't. No, you don't. Sam Bankman Freed was one guy out of billions of dollars of known fraud. What are we doing here? Yeah, and so actually, it's probably a good point to one I use it too. So if you are into Bitcoins and cryptocurrency, one of the things you can do, one simple thing you could do is use an offline wallet. So you actually have the private keys. If the company that you're working with gets hacked, then you could be protected. So definitely understand the technology and your options for staying safe. Because when Kevin was talking about cryptography earlier, cryptographic keys, the public and private keys, that is one of the ways that these institutions can fail is simply a human opened up a bad email, hackers got in, they key logged, they stole private keys or something. And right. that one person can be the gateway to six, seven hundred million dollars being stolen, including your Bitcoin. So understand how to protect yourself. And um... I mean, the true way to protect yourself is to get out. It's a giant scam. Speaking of giant scams, NFTs were basically just a grift to transfer wealth from unsuspecting people to the wealthy. There were only eighty two million dollars in transactions actions of NFT trades in 2020, but by 2021, that number had grown to 17 billion. It was basically a pump and dump scheme in which it built up a bunch of hype so that the early investors could scam a bunch of people into buying NFTs, and those early investors could then cash out, leaving the vast majority of late adopters with worthless assets as the market cratered, which is exactly what happened. Paris Hilton and Jimmy Fallon hyping up those stupid bored ape yacht club images got average consumers to think it was a weird new type of investment that they should participate in. The arrogance of the NFT bros who uh, turned around a year later and were like, what do you mean I can't protect my JPEG was hilarious because f those tech bros, but also pretty sad. Like, I mean, a lot of them are morons and sort of deserve to get hyped, but also not everyone's a rube. And I, I don't know, like there's this weird thing I have with NFTs where I'm like, yeah, dummy, of course. How did you not know that a JPEG wasn't somehow encrypted and protected for you? But also like, yeah, that was the point of this entire NFT scheme was to find guys like that, convince them that Paris Hilton would, I don't know, sleep with them if they both had a bored API club image and then they got screwed like it's I feel bad and not that bad but like a little bad because they're still human beings who don't deserve to have bad things happen to them there's a class action lawsuit against Jimmy Fallon and a bunch of others as well because yeah you all it's fraud it was just fraud I don't know if I should say allegedly so no one can screw me but like it's bad yeah and actually it, it reminds me a little bit of the um for anybody any of our listeners who are familiar with the fire festival story that was one of the earliest it might have <laughs> right. been the first time where influencers were held accountable for their for their part in the in the fraud right so they they right. were hit with a class action lawsuit and there's a lot of big names on that list too like <laughs> Alleged. Kim Kardashian, I Allegedly. think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Serena Williams, Kevin Hart, Gwyneth Paltrow. Uh, well, I mean, come on. That one hurts. No. Gwyneth Paltrow is the queen of a bull <laughs> empire. Goop is just total nonsense. Oh. Deserves to be shut down. Oh, how dare you. Gwyneth Paltrow. <laughs> Madon Madonna. What's in the box? Justin Bieber? How could you do that, I mean, Justin? Allegedly. Justin Bieber also got screwed. I do appreciate that Justin Bieber, I'm pretty sure, got screwed. Like, he had like a $200,000 NFT that he lost all of the money on. I'm sorry. Sorry. Now I get visions of the 36 of a defendants all sitting around on the Monday. Justin's not flying in until the Tuesday and they're all saying, how can we screw Bieber? <laughs> 
<laughs> I feel so bad for the kid. I just feel so bad for the kid. Like they, they all knew the right time to pull out. It's a bit, did anybody call Justin? Oh, <laughs> shit. <No. laughs> <laughs> yes, Snoop Dogg, Post Malone, allegedly, uh, NBA yep. star Steph Curry. I mean, Matt Damon. Matt Damon with that stupid crypto ad. Oh, Matt Damon. And he's controversial, too, because he's always talking about what's right and wrong and strikes mm-hmm. and we should support the actors and blah, blah. And there he is, like, yep. policing people, yep. allegedly. I have to keep saying allegedly. allegedly. We'll just keep um, saying allegedly. I'll just edit it in four more times. But it's <laughs> it's it's a it's a good time to remind all the famous people listening: you are now accountable for the things you associate yourselves with. Right. That screw the little guy, right? Like, right. We're not going to take it anymore. <laughs> well, we're going to mostly take we're it. We're mostly going to take it. <laughs> Every once in a while when it gets really bad, when it gets yeah. really obviously scammy, we're going to push back a little bit. But while you're screwing us, we want you to know that we know <laughs> right. what you're doing. So yep. if that doesn't make you feel guilty, I don't know what will. But yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, it's terrible. And this is my, again, fundamentally my challenge with it. The rug pulls, right? It, the pump and dumps. Right. We just saw the, and even that in today, the SEC, there are companies I could name today that I know that they're pumping up and then they're reverse splitting and they're, they're, they're garbage companies, right? And the SEC is slow to get to some of those companies. But I feel like we built some regulations and the SEC does their best. This is so unregulated. When you can do a rug pull and pull your money out at the right time and leave the investors holding the bag when you can do that and it's called unethical not illegal there's a problem because it should always be illegal always i mean there's also the problem is illegal means nothing to a lot of these companies because the fine is a rounding error for them and when a crime can just be solved with a fine then it's just the cost of doing business it's not a crime and uh, i'm not a fan of jail time for a bunch of liberal reasons but like at some point when you send a person to jail for property crimes but you don't send people to jail for swindling billions of dollars away from people you just are telling everybody that swindling billions of dollars is just the cost of doing business and uh, we fundamentally shouldn't work that way, but we do. It's also gotten a lot worse than the last week because the Supreme Court overturned Chevron defense, which means the SEC's ability to enforce a bunch of this kind of stuff basically disappeared. So also, it's about to get a lot worse. Thanks, John Roberts. Yeah, so think about it. Do you really want to put your money there? No, please don't. Please don't. Please don't. <laughs> Send it to Kevin and I. Exactly. We will invest it wisely in ourselves. You may as well. Exactly. <laughs> and 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 it will be evident It will be evident when you see our videos where I, you know, I'll have hair plugs. You look good. Yeah, we'll look we'll look much better and and that is more than you will get when you put your money in crypto so there you go we'll look better than that stupid <laughs> <fucking ape. laughs> yeah regardless of all of the ethics regardless of the gpus burning the netherlands equivalent of energy in order to process bitcoin all of those reasons aside just from a technical perspective there's two things that are boggling to me scalability visa processes 24,000 transactions per second ethereum as of last year in 2023 could only do 30 not 30,000 30 30 transactions per second this is technology that is not designed to scale and I don't understand how anyone thinks it's going to become a part of the financial system if like Visa and MasterCard, fairly critical at this point to the plumbing of the transactional nature of the internet and the global economy is doing what? 10,000? No. Yeah. Some numbered more 10,000 times as many, a thousand times. I don't know what math I'm trying to do here, but like massively scaled better than what this technology can do. So that's insane. And then the second thing we kind of mentioned earlier, smart contracts, this idea that you can write a, a piece of code to the blockchain. And that piece of code can be like, hey, we are H&R, I don't know, what's a what's a mortgage company? We're Fannie Mae. We've written the Fannie Mae housing contract code that'll guarantee that you can reliably know that this blockchain transaction complies with what Fannie Mae considers for a good house lending situation. Except no one has ever written perfect code. That's human beings have never written perfect code. There are always bugs. There are always things that you find out. So no matter how much testing Fannie Mae does, they are going to roll out version 1.0 of the contract onto the blockchain as a smart contract and it is immutable which means it cannot get bug fixes so now version 1.1 of the thing is just a new block and you have to hope that you have the enforcement mechanisms to not use version 1.0 you like it's it's fundamentally not designed to be a good smart contracts are so stupid what what how no 
<laughs> How is that a thing? I don't understand. So, yeah. I love that you admit humans don't write perfect code, but do you know what will? The theft bot that stole other people's <laughs> code and probably also wrote it with the same bugs? Yeah, ChatGPT? Is that your answer? Is that your, your, little, your little stealer? Uh, yeah, eventually. Eventually. So, yeah. we need okay. to wait. We need... <laughs> Uh, one of the other things I was going to bring up earlier too, by the way, is with all the power challenges to, to crypto, we really should just be pumping that back in for the AI models, right? Just, I know Definitely. that's also one of your biggest challenges with, with Gen AI and AI is the power consumption. But if we shut off all the crypto, we could burn the planet slightly <laughs> slower for the next five years until GPT-5 needs double just what the crypto requires. Cool. Thank you for solving the 2030 problem and making it a 2035 problem. You have I love admit, your creative problem solving. You have to admit one has way more value than the other. No, I do not. I can admit that they are both worthless. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Anything else we should tell people about blockchain and all of its wonderful benefits to the world? I, I can. I've learned more about blockchain in the last... <laughs> 72 hours prepping for this this episode because honestly it was it was all the rage in my life like two or three years yep. ago people asking me about it everywhere yeah I we are went. very timely with this episode <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and but, but it, it is something because it, it's important people don't forget. Like, this is how societies get the wool pulled over there. It's never like a yank. It's never like who turned out the lights. Right. It's almost like, it's... is it getting dimmer in here? And then you realize, <laughs> like, wait a minute, my mortgage company collapsed and because they were in Bitcoin and right. my insurance company's gone and I'm going to lose my house. It, it's never... It's never immediate. It's gradual. Yep. And so it's important for people to stay awake on this stuff and say, what's going on with crypto? What's going on with Bitcoin? Right. It is important for people to keep bringing this back up and understand where it's at because, yeah. It's not dead. There's no. still probably billions of investment going into it. Yeah. And undoubtedly, one of your financial institutions is in there. And I guarantee you a lot of people who went under with institutions that went bust during the crashes, you would want to know what your institution is up to with these types of things. Because you know what? Ignorance is not an excuse. You can go and talk to your financial institution and find out what's your position on crypto? What are you doing? Like, what's our, what's the risk? And so I think it's important for people not to believe that, hey, I'm not buying, I'm not buying bitcoin myself it's like it's like it doesn't matter your money is somewhere your 401k was yeah and you didn't have that checked out yeah. and so yeah it kind of it's not i don't know that i should make this comparison there's that poor guy who survived hiroshima and then was in nagasaki like your 401k survived the 2008 crash or did it and now you don't know what's currently in your 401k and is gonna have to survive the bitcoin crash like it's not great Though that is a terrible example, I'm now <laughs> yeah. super fascinated. Are you telling me that he survived in the first city, traveled to the second city, and it happened again? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's one guy who was in both. And he survived both. I don't know that he survived the second one. I I don't know that detail. I just know that there was a guy who was in both. Oh, yeah. listen, he might have survived both. For you listeners, you know what I'm going to be doing for the next 30 minutes, because <laughs> now, I'm, now I'm fascinated. Now we're curious. All right, are we done? Yeah. All right, well, that's going to do it for us on this episode of Acceptance Criteria. To read articles that we've written, written on similar topics to the one we talk about here, head over to the blog at acceptancepod.com. You can also follow us on most apps. We're at acceptancepod. We'll post links to show notes and any articles from the blog over there. We're also building a community on Reddit at r slash acceptance criteria and on Discord. You can find links to both in the show notes and on the blog. And I promise we'll be moderating the crap out of them to keep it a nice little slice of the internet. For now, I'm Kevin Thomas Uland, and you can find me on most apps at K Thomas Uland. That's U-L-L-A-N-D. And I'm Andrew Greener, and you can find me on most apps at Criteria Greener. That's G-R-E-I-N-E-R. And this has been Acceptance Criteria. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to hearing from you.